Okay. Um, okay, here we are for today's Wednesday Brown Bag. Um, that uh, we should start by asking for any announcements. Um, Meg and I were just commenting that there are a lot of talks this week. Um, so check those out, out online. I know this evening at maybe 7, Carl Knapp at the of Toronto, who's a, kind of a major figure in material culture studies and archaeology, will be talking about his research on Crete. Uh, an AIA talk, and that's usually in whatever that room is, 360 or 370 one hour. But I look it up because I don't have the details, but that would be worth attending. Maybe so there's another talk. Well, um, Francis Briggs, a major figure in Pacific archaeology, is giving a talk on some of the material culture, um, materials at the Hearst Museum mm -hmm. and what they have and how that's prompted other kinds of things. Maybe you know about that. Um, I don't know. Anyway, that was in this amazing list that Sarah sent out. It was like the who's who of uh, contemporary archaeology, you know, all of them were major figures and also um, from Merced, the, the editor, yes, Mark Oldenberger, yes. from, who's the editor of current anthropology. I mean, somebody, if people are thinking of publishing there, you should go and hear what the guy thinks. Uh, <laughs> so it was just like... And know. for fans of Roman concrete, which I'm sure is most of you, uh, John Olson from the University of British Columbia, I think he's talking at two, and. Davison, is that engineering? Uh, uh, that's probably findable. Um, but there may be other announcements. Yeah. Yeah, I have an announcement about the Society for California Archaeology, which is meeting next week, Thursday the 12th through Sunday the 15th in Riverside. Mm -hmm. I'm driving down. If anybody wants to ride, let me know, or Sarah, possibly. Um, to clarify, the Spriggs talk happened yesterday, on Monday. Oh, it happened Monday. <laughs> Sorry, Monday. Monday. Oh. Um, I'd like to highlight that our a panel about working at archaeological, uh, working at agencies that hire archaeologists. It's happening on Friday at one. So if any of you teach, if any of you teach undergrads, could you please announce to them? And um, I can, I'm going to send another email out to everybody about this um, later on today. Forward yeah. on to anybody you think and might be interested in coming. Yeah, at least one of the persons who's coming is one of our PhD students, former PhD students, Jamie Cohen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's right. going to be here. Yeah. So I think there's oh, six I mean, or seven he'd be a good one to talk to about if you are getting a PhD here. Is this the kind of thing you also, you know, want to do and could do? Uh, he's decided to do that instead of going into the academic. And yeah. The panelists mentioned that from previous years say that they actually do get a lot of good leads and they hire people who come to these things. So these are opportunities for getting jobs. <laughs> Other announcements? Okay, let's get on with the talk. Uh, today we have uh, a uh, talk from uh, A.J. White, whom probably most of you know. He's in his third year here in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, he hails from Orange County. He got a Master's of Science in Geology at uh, Cal State Long Beach, uh, where there's a super great kind of archaeometric research unit. Um, he uh, does a lot of work on analyzing fecal remains, and I've kind of strained my brain for some kind of pun. But there's probably no <laughs> pun that you can let make, so I'll take a, a bow all to that. Uh, and uh, uh, haha, and refrain. Uh, and um, just point out that uh, he's going to be talking today, I guess, about research in, in Jordan that he's carrying out, I guess, in connection with Lisa Maher, who spoke last week uh, uh, at uh, the uh, uh, the site of, of uh, Harana, uh, and in particular, uh, in his abstract, he promises he'll be looking at the issue of, of water and how site contamination, I guess, from uh, donkey feces leads to some difficulties in kind of understanding that, but he promises to uh, engage these big picture issues about uh, what's driving cultural evolution. Um, I don't know if he's like related to uh, Leslie White, perhaps, but uh, uh, so we could be in for quite an interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, hour ahead of us. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to AJ so we can hear about uh, what he wants to tell us about his research. Wow. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll first say that, that you have amazing restraint to not make the poop puns, because everyone else, myself included, just jumped straight to it. Uh, would it be nice if we kept like one of the lights on in the back, maybe? Like that other one? Yeah. Sorry, just since we got a small group, it's like good to see a little bit. So, um, hey everybody, so I've got a little bit of a silly hook to my talk here. Settle down now. 
uh, contemplation and consternation over the role of water in Hieronophor's proto-sedentism. Uh, what I'd like to be talking about is Hieronophor, which is a large epipaleolithic hunter-gatherer site from eastern Jordan uh, that dates to the 20th to 19th millennia uh, before present and uh, assess uh, climatic events that are known to have occurred in the area with environmental changes uh, from around the site itself and see if there might be any um, connections there to what's happening in terms of the development at this site. Um, so that's kind of the contemplation part. The consternation, uh, you'll know it when you see it. It'll probably involve me saying something like, those damn camels. Um, so so <laughs> you'll, you'll know it when we get to it. So um, before I get much forward, I have a little bit of a disclaimer, which is that um, when the uh, archaeological site that you're about to be talking about has the, uh, the world's authority on it, in the room about 10 feet in front of you. There's this kind of added layer of pressure. So I don't want to, some of the things I'm saying here are more of my initial thoughts um, on this site as I continue along with my dissertation research. So um, I might be going a little bit far out on some of these things. I'm not trying to bring Lisa down with me. In fact, feel free to jump in if you, if you think it's need to, to moderate. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, just want to uh, put that disclaimer out there. Um, now that it's out there, I can say whatever I want, I think. Is that, is that how it works, legally? Um, okay, so the first thing I'd like to announce is that I am the first person ever to consider climate change and cultural developments in the Middle East. So, so it's a pretty big, pretty good accomplishment. Got a lot of people to thank. Um, but I'm getting, I'm getting a nervous look like, okay, that's, that's right, that's not what we talked about. Uh, actually, um, there's been over a century of intense conversation about this topic. Um, that's yielded perhaps thousands of scholarly works on it. So this is just a very late sort of entry into all of this, um, trying to kind of uh, contemplate some of those ideas at this site. Um, in particular within Hieronophore, a lot of these ideas have been presented elsewhere as well. Um, and, and it's kind of just making the most of uh, what I have available to me now with that. So um, along that note, let's kind of look at the beginning of some of these ideas of environmental theories in this part of the world, and we can work from there. So if we look back to the early uh, 20th century, you have people like Pompelli, who's a geologist, and he's doing things like uh, going around Iran um, and saying, if man inhabited the earth during the later glacial or fluvial epochs, Iran would probably have been peculiarly favorable to his development by reason of the relatively warm climate and moderate degree of rainfall, which appears to have enjoyed. So as he's going around, he's seeing all these ruins, and thinking, I'm also seeing evidence for a different climate in the past. Maybe that's related. Maybe things were nicer to what my perspective of nice is. And that could be an, explaining, uh, an, an, uh, an explanation there. Um, now, of course, there are people living in these climates that was hot right around them. So that kind of defeats some of that idea just right from the get-go. But we can see this kind of early sort of link between um, uh, past climates and human um, uh, populations going on at this point. Uh, v. Gordon Child, a uh, much um, more well-known archaeologist, um, comes along with what's later called the Oasis Theory. And to set the stage here, he's talking about, you know, in the late Pleistocene, you have these dry conditions. So he's saying, desiccation set in. To get food and water, the grass eaters, so the, the herbivores, uh, would have to congregate around a diminishing number of springs and streams in oases. And they would be brought up against man too. So it's a pretty straightforward idea. He's saying we have these limited water resources that are concentrating both people and animals, and that maybe you get um, the chemistry for domestication to come from that sort of setting. Simple idea, but to say the least, in the 100 years or so since then, we've been able to say, okay, it's not nearly this simple, right? <laughs> to kind of just say this is this one-to-one -one sort of thing, um, particularly with domestication of any one animal, let alone all of them. And he later starts to look at you know, plants as well here. So um, we can at least say we've got some problems here in the simplicity of it. And in terms of saying we have an environmental change and there should be a equal part change in culture is kind of the, the thing here. And what we, made her, what we later might uh, call these to be determinist ideas in a certain sense, right? So environmental determinism is something that we're, you know, today kind of looking back into some earlier ideas and saying, you know, this might fit in this, this sort of framework. But if I were to kind of say what um, is at the heart of this issue, it's that to in a, a determinist idea, it's that the environment 
determines human behavior and shifts in culture and is the primary driver of change, okay? Now, there's been many critiques of this way of thinking um, since a lot of these ideas were happening in the early 1900s. Um, I'd say that some of the key critiques are, number one, that there's little room for human agency in all of this, right? The idea is people are basically dust in the wind. And if something happens, then, oh, they got to go with it. Not a whole lot of room for um, humans making decisions on their own behalf. Uh, and secondly, um, this is more of a technical problem, but a lot of these uh, environmental relationships, both determinist and perhaps not, really rely heavily on correlations between environmental data sets and archaeological data sets. And there's an inherent problem in that um, they're coming from different chronologies in different parts of the world. So for example, you might be working in the Indus River Valley or something like that, and you want a good temperature reconstruction, which is a hard thing to do. So you might look to Greenland ice cores and something like that and using that data. Now the problem is, can you apply climate data that's taken from another continent at a much different latitude to something going on in another part of the world? Well, that's, that's kind of a big jump, isn't it, right? To go from, um, you know, uh, uh, wonderful climate data that's, you know, uh, being drawn from the poles and then trying to put that in archaeologies of other parts of the world. So we have kind of a problem there with this geographical scale. Another one deals with chronology. So each chronology, especially for using radiocarbon dating, has its own quirks, has its own air associated with it. And as we try to add different data sets to that, we compound problems of chronology, such that if we're interested in what's happening on the scale of a human's lifespan, and we have air bars that approach 100 years, can we really say meaningful things about when events happened that mattered to uh, cultural developments, right? So here are these kind of built-in problems. Now, since um, these critiques have been addressed, I think we have um, gone some way, both theoretically and methodologically, in addressing them, uh, at least partially. So for one, if we look at various environmental theories in archaeology, and don't get too into this um, chart yet, if this is still kind of a work in progress, what I'm attempting to show here is various uh, environmental archaeology theories um, that relate to a plot of basically the degree of agency afforded to people, and then on the left to right, the kind of emphasis on um, various factors of human and non-human origin. So as you get this way, I mean emphasis on human factors like ability to uh, have burning and domestication of animals and, and things like that that are uh, mostly on, on humans' behalf. And then environmental factors that are non-human, such as things like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that we have very little to do with. Um, now, again, don't, don't look too far into this, but what we see is as we have determinism kind of in the bottom here, what I see is as we get close to the present, this kind of migration ideas towards allowing greater amount of agency and greater emphasis on what people are doing to the environment and making that a two-way street. So not just like the environment does one thing and humans have to respond. As an example of that, um, if we look to historical ecology, um, among other things, the environment has shown um, not just as a thing apart from humans, but something with humans. The environment is this complex web of human and non-human entanglement, where one affects the other, the other affects one. So we talk a lot about burning on this campus, um, for example, and I think that fits well nicely into sort of looking at human impacts on the environment, not just the other way around. Um, you can look to human ecodynamics which is good at looking at things like persistence. So um, you can look at how in the face of environmental uh, perturbations, which is a way of saying just like big climate events, like all of a sudden, or environmental events, like a tsunami or a, uh, an earthquake, we often find that humans can take those punches and that there isn't a distinct cultural change after these events. People go back to what they were doing which is definitely a departure from saying, if there's a big change in the environment, there must be a equal part change in what people are doing, right? This is saying, no, it doesn't have to be like this. So here's sort of these ways that we've um, uh, gotten at that critique of, of allowing more human agency. But how do we get at that second part, which is looking at um, these problems of different chronologies and different geographical scales and putting together um, archeological environmental data? And I think the answer here 
uh, which has been put forward by other people as well, is to try to get these two data sets as close together as we can. So instead of just you know, relying on climate data from far away, let's make it from the site that we're interested in. And what I want to stress in particular is getting these two data sets from the same source. And what I mean by that is actually the same dirt that you submit to the lab for whatever sort of paleoenvironmental analysis, you're taking half of that and you're looking at maybe some sort of indicator of, uh, of humans through a biomarker perhaps, or maybe you're looking at the artifacts that are in that same sample. And what that does is that kind of gets rid of this problem of chronology because it's coming from the same place and you can use str stratigraphic relationships to kind of look at change through time and you can throw out these different radiocarbon dated chronology problems away, right? We can make these direct relationships. And so what I'm showing here in the a graph to the right is something that I showed at last year's brown bag, which is um, a human biomarker um, uh, from a, a type of molecule that we're calling the fecal stanols in blue. Um, in relation to uh, oxygen isotope data, which is, uh, can be suggested of uh, the amount of precipitation in area. And what I uh, am trying to push for is that we can make this comparison between these more um, data sets that deal more with the environment and more with people. We can look at them together because it's, it's from the same sediment source and we can just use stratigraphy to look at changes and be pretty confident about their relationships. So on that, I'm going to now briefly talk more about this human biomarker, um, the fecal stanol molecules, because it's a brown bag, and someone's got to be putting the brown in the bag. <laughs> so um, we will see, I couldn't resist. I, I couldn't do it. Um, so you've seen this before in, in some of the, <laughs> several of the other talks. Um, and this is not the uh, emphasis of today's. Um, discussion, so I'm going to kind of push through this. If you have questions at the end about this method, feel free to talk about it. But those of you who have seen this before are already kind of pros at this. Basically, um, fecal stanol molecules refer to a suite of molecules that start um, in the gut from the ingestion of cholesterol, and cholesterol becomes degraded into a form called coprosinol, which is a waste product of bacteria. And so it's something that the bacteria don't want, your body doesn't want, and becomes poop. Um, and it becomes actually a significant part of poop, up to half a percent of a human stool could be this one molecule, caprosinol, which is, which is a lot. Um, and then uh, it can get buried in situ or transported somewhere, but the point is, when it ends up in the ground, um, it will stay there and will persist for hundreds of thousands of years. And the reason that is, is because no one wants it. It'll just sit there, the bacteria don't want it, they want have nothing to do with it, and it'll just sit there forever. Just like Mike Bloomberg, you know, like, <laughs> after, you know, just sit there forever, no one wants it, but it's there. Um, I'm sorry, last night was crazy. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, we have these molecules that, that can persist in nature for a very long time, and what makes them useful to us is that we can look at changes in their concentration over time as a proxy for human population change. All right, and so that's kind of something that might relate to the archaeological data sets, and we can plot that data right alongside paleo-environmental data from the same source. So I'd argue that we did that to some um, good effect from Cahokia, which is what I talked about here previously, and we're able to show that um, right when we see a decline in the fecal stanol values, um, shown as the top trends, uh, we see evidence for, um, oh God, for drought. Um, in the oxygen isotopes from this lake sediment and also a uh, uptick in flooding happening at the same time, which seems to suggest that there might be um, climate change being a partial reason for why people are starting to decide to leave the site. So that's what we, we talked about there and um, we, we had some success with that. Now, what we want to do is say, can we bring this to Hirana 4? And can we um, try this in this, this much older context? And it's something that people hadn't really tried before. Um, so we thought it's worth a shot, so we're going to now transfer over in the world to Hirana 4, so we. All right. <laughs> um, so we are in the eastern Jordanian desert, and Hirana 4 is, um, you know, by satellite, um, basically a smidge in the desert. Doesn't look, a whole look, lot, look like a whole lot from, um, from a bird's eye view, but from the surface, it's a very impressive site. It's incredibly dense, so everything in the foreground um, is an artifact, um, and it's um, very sudden in appearance. So you just go from almost no artifacts to just a big, huge spike in uh, 
Jordan and Felicia and I kind of tested that this summer and we did a survey and indeed it seems that there just is nothing around and then it just suddenly bumps up right when you get to Hirana, both on the surface and subsurface. So um, this is an incredibly tight and dense archaeological site and we thought it would be a good place to try out this, this poop method. So we did and here are our initial results from um, last year and what we found is that there, uh, <laughs> things look good. Um, we, we found the, uh, the molecules in, in um, a measurable amount in the upper strata of the site. And what we found is that right when you hit this contact with what we're calling the wetland deposits, which is a marl, it's very clay rich, um, very compact as well, um, they drop down to zero uh, to, the, to, the, um, to depth. And that makes sense because the upper deposits are where we have cultural material at this site. So we thought, hey, where we have the artifacts, that's where we're finding the, the fecal molecules. We did it. <laughs> but then you keep going. <laughs> and uh, so we thought, okay, this is promising. Let's try it in different parts of the site. And let's also try it off-site. And all four locations showed pretty much the same trend. We have some at the surface, it goes down a little bit, and it spikes right at this contact between the more permeable cultural-rich silts to the uh, impermeable, relatively impermeable clay layer uh, beneath there. And then it goes to zero beyond that. And this happens throughout the site, well, not throughout the site, but in the places that we did test on the site. And also in an offsite location about 100 meters away. So not very far, but still not within the site stratigraphy. And so there are two sort of possible explanations here. One is that this is in fact uh, in situ molecules um, that relate to what was happening at the time of the site's occupation. Um, both off-site and on-site. Or, but it's a little suspicious because everywhere keeps showing this kind of buildup right at this contact. So another hypothesis is that there might be some sort of contamination and modern stuff is percolating through the permeable material and collecting at this boundary right here, right? So one thing that we thought, okay, so what could be possible contaminants at this site? And it turns out that there's a lot of uh, camels that go by this site all the time um, and you know when we're around the desert you see them what probably once every two or three days something like that um, frequently going by and camels make a lot of poop um, a whole lot of it um, that's some of it I hope did anyone bring their lunch yeah Bill <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make this hard on your life okay uh, anyway um, so yeah so we thought Maybe we should test this camel poop to see if it is one of the small handfuls of animals that we know that we we know that there are a small handful of animals that can make um, fecal stainal molecules uh, that that we make as well. But it's a small group, and they make a very small amount compared to us. And we didn't know if camels were part of that group or not. So we decided to test it. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> that we have invested more time, money, and energy in camel poop than any other lab on Earth. So you can't say that I didn't go to Berkeley and do nothing, <laughs> you know? So this is it. We actually, so this is in the lab. This is Long Beach State. Um, it is a lab that I'm very familiar with, and it's easy to, to, to work there. Um, so we, we had it undergo um, extraction. And so what you're looking at, this thing smelled really weird, um, is basically the, uh, the lipid extract of camel poop. Also, another quick funny story, because I think I have time for it is that, so we picked it up in the field, desiccated and dried out, and we put it in a little plastic baggie and it got kind of crushed up. Dried kale poop looks a lot like weed. <laughs> and I didn't know that. And then so we, we, we shifted it over, and it all worked out fine. But it was, I was really worried that we wouldn't be able to bring it <laughs> to America because it looks so suspicious. But um, uh, sure enough, we were able to, um, to analyze it and take it to a mass spectrometer to find out how much of these molecules are contained in it, if any. And what we find here is that camel, which is uh, shown here in red, does make a small amount of these molecules. And um, this is compared to sort of the other animals that have been mostly tested. There's not a whole large body that have been. And as you can see, it's so much smaller compared to humans, which is this, this, uh, you know, this towering bar right there. But you can imagine how after hundreds to even thousands of years of herders going over this place, that small amount might add up and be so much that we can't at this moment say whether or not our record is attributable to people or not. So that's the consternation part of them. That's the damn camels um, coming in and making our life a little bit harder. So this is not the end of the story, though. Um, I think, first of all, it's important for method development 
to go out and show, hey, we really need to think about other animals that can contribute to this molecule. And so there's a whole like animal cracker study to be done where we think about going out and just sampling a bunch of animals. So that's kind of at the back of our heads. Um, and just seeing, you know, in the wide world of animal poop, what's going on. Um, but um, in terms of understanding Hieronophore archaeologically, right now there's not a whole lot we can say from it. So what else can we, can, can we turn to? Um, and so for that we can do it the old fashioned way. And we can look to um, you know, what's going on at the site. So what I'll be showing you now is some very preliminary, um, not even data, but more just observations um, from uh, the past uh, season's excavation. Um, in particular from this, um, uh, this hole that was dug. Um, uh, in June, um, and it's called uh, Robber Hole One. So Lisa's very good at making lemonade from lemons, um, and we had a, a bunch of sort of looter pits all throughout the site when we showed up this past summer. And there's one particularly deep one, and which is too bad because this poor person was just digging there trying to find something important, and just kept on going through bones. They just kept going and probably breaking their back to do so. Because um, this is very difficult things to dig through. Those of you that have been there, can, there's a head nod. Um, so, uh, so she was like, let's, let's open this up as a, as a unit and take advantage of what's already been dug. So the upper deposits are a little bit disturbed, and I won't really be presenting data from there. But we can look to the lower deposits as a good sort of thing about what's happening in the buildup to the occupation of this site, uh, particularly in regards to the environment. So if we look at um, sort of the stratigraphy here, in general, what we're seeing is we have these, I'm sorry that this isn't, this isn't, um, uh, yeah, maybe for this one, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, my experiment isn't working out as well as I thought. Um, we have these brown clays towards the bottom um, that are uh, interrupted by this pure white fine sand that seems to extend to other locations in the site as well. Now, that requires a lot more investigation. It's a really interesting unit, and I don't have a whole lot to say about it because we really need to get some measurements on it to say more. So I'm just going to go ahead, and we're not going to discuss this too much. What we see is, in general, we have these kind of darker colored material down here, these brown clays um, with um, kind of uh, slightly um, more silty material, more cultural material as you go to the top. And my interpretations of this are what I'm showing here. Now, this isn't real data. I want to be clear about that. This is what it seems, based on field notes, is going on. So this is, these are not real numbers, um, but what I uh, assume it will look similar to this once we get some, some measurements back. And so what we're seeing is that in general, due to the dark coloration of these lower soils, as well as things like root traces um, and uh, freshwater stales, things like that, we're seeing a fair amount of organic content in these lowermost uh, deposits at the site. Um, and we get a transition to this much lighter colored material at the top that reflects this in tradition from you know, much more fine-grained material, again, ignoring these white sands, which are uh, pretty interesting but don't have a whole lot to say yet, to um, more silty material towards the top. And so a preliminary interpretation here, which has been backed up by multiple uh, other researchers at this site, is that these lower deposits um, seem to indicate a fair amount of, or some amount of water. All right, with those freshwater sails, with those root chases, there's some um, bits of soil that appear glade and might be anoxic, so at least standing water um, and not completely dry. Um, and as we get out into these deposits, we find evidence of desiccation. So we find um, uh, precipitate minerals, um, we find uh, gypsum roses, we find carbonate um, ribbons that are coming through there. Um, and um, a, a decrease in the amount of um, just kind of darker colored material as well. Um, so all that seems to be shifting to a wetland that is retracting and, and perhaps getting smaller as we get into the development of the site. And this holds up throughout the site stratigraphy. So what I've attempted to do now here is show some of the um, deeper excavations at this site. Um, and this is not to scale, so these uh, sections are much further apart than they're shown here. Um, but in general, you can see this kind of transition from wetland deposits to um, the upper cultural deposits. Now, what you'll see is that there doesn't appear to be a lot of obvious continuity um, between strata here. And it's very uh, difficult to actually try to link any sort of one layer that you find at the bottom of the site to anywhere else. So my interpretation from that 
is that what you're seeing is kind of a patchwork of wet, dry, vegetated, not vegetated landscape, similar to any modern, uh, modern wetland, where it's more of like a mosaic sort of pattern. And you're not going to find just uniform beds throughout, right? And in general, what we're seeing is something that's perhaps more, more uh, uh, wet, more um, vegetated, that's starting to um, get drier. It's starting to retract as we get closer to the occupation of the site. So that's this kind of um, interpretation that has been put out before, I should mention, um, that seems to be backed up by what we're seeing this summer at RH1, at that robber hole deposit. Now, we can't look to um, fecal stanols to sort of have this parallel um, what's happening with humans because of those damn camels that I told you about, right? So what else can we look to to try to um, link archaeological and, and uh, environmental information? And to that, um, we can at least look to artifacts and say what's going on there. Um, so uh, what I have here is um, the um, lithic density um, of two excavations from the site. The one on the left was compiled by Felicia de Pena and has very nicely um, allowed me to use these data today. So thank you very much for that, Felicia. Um, and what we're seeing is that basically you have um, next, to, next to no artifacts. There's occasional artifacts um, in some of these deeper layers. But where things really get off and running at this site is where you see this sort of inflection point here towards um, uh, more artifacts. And that inflection point happens about at this transition from what I'm saying is going from clearly kind of wet to it's starting to get pretty, it's starting to dry out um, at both places. So that's kind of further sort of indicating that what seems to be going on is that as this area is drying out, that's when people start to really show up in big numbers, right? Not just occasional coming by, but really make the start of this uh, decent sized archeological site. And there's that correlation there with what's happening with uh, environmental factors in, in the, the strata. So, so that's where I'd like to, to go with there. Now, the next sort of question is, if you agree with me <laughs> that that's what that appears to show, then could people have been doing this anywhere in the landscape about 19,000 and a half years ago? And so for that, we need to think, you know, is the uh, environmental context of Harana, um, is there anything that's kind of different about it? So this is something that I've been telling you, so you know, this, I want to be, this is my more disclaimer moment where this is very just like um, uh, circumstantial, would not hold up in a, in a court sort of thing. But let me put on my crazy hat and say that for one, we see a difference in um, the depth to uh, bedrock in this wadi. So uh, at the northern side of the wadi, uh, bedrock is in the valley floor at basically, there's no depth to bedrock. It's totally exposed. If we go closer to the site, um, we know that it's at least three meters down. We don't know how far bedrock is down from where the site is. Uh, another funny little story. <laughs> this is this mysterious hole <laughs> that just showed up in the desert, and, and one of the um, government representatives almost fell into it and told us about it. And we were able to say, well, this is a great opportunity to see what the stratigraphy is like. So uh, Lisa very um, uh, nicely arranged a ladder to come in so he'd go down and see. And what we see is just three meters of alluvium, basically, um, with, with bedrock not in sight. So there's a discrepancy here in the depth to bedrock of at least more than three meters. Who knows? Um, and maybe that discrepancy might act as some sort of barrier to groundwater flow. If there is this kind of, you know, you have one area where the bedrocks are at the surface, that's going to push stuff up to the surface, right? That's going to push water up and perhaps make this area akin to a spring. And spring is like one of those kind of loaded words where there's a lot that goes with it. But the reason why I think I want to say that is because it makes it seem like this place is something that, that is here for a very specific geological reason. Um, now, again, this is totally still crazy hat. Um, but um, uh, as we look at the, the geology of the region, there are many fault traces that trend from northwest to southeast throughout here. Um, and so this took like uh, three days to get this, these, data, these geologic maps, so um, we earned them. Um, but you can see how, you know, in general you have these uh, trends that aren't mapped here, but people have identified them in the region um, coming nearby. So we, ha we don't have a smoking gun here, but it just suggests that there might be offset in bedrock that could account 
for that difference that we see and act as some sort of barrier to groundwater flow. Now, <laughs> again, further maybe things here is that there's some interesting things about the site's um, geomorphology. So for one is that it kind of dips almost to uh, the south, about seven degrees. So when you look at the edges of the site, uh, the layers kind of fall down a little bit. So it, um, it seems like there's some deflation going on here, and it's uneven. So if we look back at this figure, it seems like um, it, it's, it's not falling down in unison. It's kind of coming down and deflating unequally uh, throughout the site itself. And what could account for that deflation? Well, possibly if groundwater was higher in the past and that was going away, that could account for some um, uh, adjustments in, in, the, in the sediment that would cause deflation right, from that groundwater going away. Now, there has been a lot of groundwater going away very recently, by the way. Um, so when we think about this area, it is in the Azraq um, sort of watershed, um, which is very large. And that's a, uh, that's a groundwater pool that has been largely depleted through the explosion of Amman as a world city. Um, and so there's been a huge you know, sort of loss of groundwater here. Um, and that might explain why it's so hard to kind of think about where the, ground, where the water is at Harana now. So, um, Lisa brought this to my attention that I thought was a wonderful kind of anecdote here uh, when we're talking about, you know, what's going on with the water at the site. And she pointed me to um, this uh, work by Harding, who was a uh, British archaeologist involved with uh, Jordanian archaeology in the um, sort of uh, early to mid 20th century. So here's this little story. So, and he's talking about, oh, by the way, sorry. He's talking about Qasr Harana, which is a early Islamic period. Um, it's called a desert castle, but it's more likely probably a caravan stopping point, which is located very close to the site. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe a mile away, something like that, from two kilometers. Two kilometers. Yeah, so you've got, you've got multinational <laughs> uh, explanations for how far <laughs> it is. Um, so very close to the site. And this archaeologist is talking about it. He's saying, all right, so one curious feature of Qasr Harana is that there seems to be no provision for a supply of water, neither well nor cistern. That there is water somewhere in the vicinity is strongly suggested by the following episode. A small white dog. This is how crazy I am. I'm, 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 I'm using dog evidence. <laughs> a small white dog was noticed wandering about the site, and obviously at home, though there were no human inhabitants within miles of the place. Two months later, the same small dog was still there. Ha ha! <laughs> um, and after all, the do <laughs> sorry. And after all, dogs must drink. <laughs> um, apparently, the dog had succeeded in solving the problem that still defeats us: where the inhabitants of Harana got their water. So this little antidote shows that okay, where is this water coming from? How's this dog surviving? And again, today, uh, water pools up in the air mostly just from rain, right? And it's it is ephemeral. But if we have this lowered of the, of, of the water table that's happened more recently, you could see how perhaps if we did have a much more elevated water table, that would start to be much more affected by any sort of groundwater barrier in making this place um, more of a uh, specific source of water. All right? Now, again, if you follow with me there, which you know, maybe I've got 10% of the audience now, <laughs> we can keep going. And you're kind of linking this up to what's happening regionally. Now, I did warn about the danger of looking at regional um, evidence for site-specific things. But in this case, they agree. Because what we're seeing is that, yeah. In this case, what we're seeing is that uh, speleothem oxygen isotope data um, from Kays in Israel show a, a notable increase to about the end of the last glacial maximum, which is right when this site starts to really um, become occupied heavily. And that's an inflection point there where um, then it starts to go into decline. Now, how um, some paleoclimatologists have interpreted this signal is one of drying as we get more positive in these isotopic values. And so that corresponds to what we see at the site itself with evidence for drying of those wetland deposits right before we see the archaeological material really explode at the site. You can see that in, in um, another regional speleothem here. Uh, this is from Turkey, and also from Lake Lasan, which is Paleo uh, Dead Sea. And so what we see is a, a decrease in, in the Dead Sea levels right about to where the site starts to be occupied, and then things kind of plateau for a little bit, suggesting that while Harana was occupied, there wasn't um, dramatic changes either way, really. Um, and then 
towards the end of its occupation, there seems to be another important climatic shift going on in the region that does correlate to um, or coincide at least with the end of our occupation at Hrana 4. Now we can't talk much about the end of the occupation because that is a big erosional unconformity and we don't have strata beyond that to say what was happening after uh, Hrana 4. Um, but at least we can talk about what happened before it. So I would like to say at this point that it seems to be that there might be a connection between time that change and what was happening in terms of decisions being made to occupy this particular area. Now, uh, to continue with kind of pushing some buttons here, um, can you then consider Hirana 4 as a sort of proto-sedentism? Now, this is something that I think it's hard to say one way or the other, but what we can say is that there is evidence to suggest that occupation here is perhaps semi-annual, at least multi-seasonal um, that we have here. So people are here for not just very short amounts of time. They seem to be here for um, some part of the year, perhaps a good part of the year. Um, the artifact concentrations here are incredibly dense, further suggesting a high investment in this one area. We have other investments, hut structures, uh, which have been said to be homes, you know, things that are not um, ephemeral as well, things that are meant to be um, durable and meant to last perhaps. Um, we find uh, drying racks here, others, I'm drying infrastructure, that's uh, a weird word to use, but um, more sort of investment in being one in one area. Uh, we find a bunch of shell and ochre, we find interesting things like incised stone and bone, all at this site, and I do wonder if perhaps you can conceive of that as a moving towards the direction of sedentism at this site. So if you did, you could conceive about, are there any correlations there to what might be happening with climate change that we just discussed. Now, I'll um, have the last sort of uh, leg of this talk kind of be considering how is it that we present climate change in archaeology to the public? Because I think it's important, and I think it's something that we need to con consider whenever we bring this up. Um, so the reason I bring this up is I've been thinking about a lot that I think the way that we talk about archaeology and climate change, a lot of the times in terms of how it's introduced to the public, sometimes by third-party journalists and popular science writers, is one of almost like a scare tactic. Like, we had something and then it was lost. Do you want that or are you going to do something about it, right? Um, and it's something that uh, kind of focuses on the negative, like, you know, things went away, you know, and, and, and it's like, it's, it's something that's supposed to be scary, kind of. Right? To, now, that can be very effective. And I actually sometimes think, okay, yeah, that works on me. I, I'm really interested in trying to, um, you know, hopefully change my habits to, um, to help combat climate change. But it doesn't work on a large sector of the American public. So this uh, headline here is a headline about one of those Cahokia studies that, that I had put out. And it's in Fox News. <laughs> I had shared this with a couple of grad students here. Um, but you know, if, we are kind of, if the takeaway is, here's an example of climate change in an archaeological sense where we should be kind of scared of it, you know, something is lost, uh, a lot of people are just sort of uh, mocking that. And so if you don't really think that climate change is scary in the first place, it's going to be a very ineffective argument to the public, right? And so you find things like, uh, so climate ch uh, change affected the population of Kokia. Um, so the climate changes, regardless of fossil fuel burning machines, exist or not? Interesting. Um, looks like that nasty global warming back in the 1400s drove them away. If only they had parked their cars and made their cows stop farting, they could still be here today. So these sort of comments make it clear that this message isn't connecting with everyone. Now you might say, you naive little man, like, of course, that's not going to work. It's Fox News. But I would argue that this represents a fair amount of the United States. And that we can't, in, in good faith, try to move forward in combating climate change unless we get as many people as we can under that umbrella. So maybe it's worth considering how can we maybe restructure the argument? Instead of maybe going on a negative and saying something is lost, something that you should be scared of, can we throw it as a positive, as an opportunity for some sort of innovation? And so if, and this is a big if, if you agree that there might be some involvement of climatic changes in what happened at Hirana 4, now it didn't, what happened at Hirana 4 didn't have to happen, 
And that's why I want to bring up that the, the role of human agency in all this. They didn't have to um, decide to you know, live in greater numbers in this smaller area and perhaps have different things come of it. They could have um, run for the hills, so to speak, right? They could have lived in smaller uh, population sizes. There's many ways that people can, um, can navigate this. But through their agency, they chose to innovate, perhaps. And what I'd like to end on is maybe that is a message that we can put forward in terms of, instead of just looking for examples of scary things in climate change and archaeology, what if we look for examples of things where people are innovating? And it's like, this is a way for us now. And what's the takeaway? Well, you don't have to, you know, don't think of this as scary. Think of this is a thing where you need to get in on it too. This is how we make big investments. This is how we uh, restructure the energy grid for a whole new world and maybe throw it in a positive light. So uh, with all of those crazy things concluded, I will, uh, I will end there. Thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you. <laughs> if so, I hate it. I mean, uh, it's the best evidence I got. It's amazing how often dogs feature in major discoveries, like finding cave art by going down a little hole. And so we really have to look for the dogs and sometimes children um, as innovators and uh, the key symbols. So there you go. Right. It's, it's one of the many dog stories. <laughs> the many dog stories. Thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> And then I died in the desert three days later because <laughs> the water went away. <laughs> anyway, yeah, big. So, so where are you going to go from here with this? Are you going to take some more samples or something? You know, what are your next steps? I mean, this is a great story. It's, um, of course, engaging, and I hope it's, I think most of us probably really like for ending. Uh, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons I never liked Glass uh, by Jerry Diamond, but this is an even better one. So uh, yeah, there's a great point, and um, uh, hopefully towards graduation, <laughs> which is uh, right. Which is so um, I, I I have very little data right now, um, you know, and, and we kind of got um, uh, thwarted a little bit by some of the, the fecal stain evidence, which we um, which again it's not useless. I, I think there's going to be some good stuff that comes from it. But in terms of so now we really need to fill in um, with with uh, uh, paleo environmental data that RH1 that I told you about. So we have that sampled. I just need to get into the lab. And, and start getting data to back up what I think is happening and get actual data from not just that um, excavation, but from multiple throughout the site to try to say, can we really securely say that this, uh, you know, this uh, desiccation is happening and it, and it fits in really nicely with uh, regional events as well. So that, I think that just requires more data. And so that's what I'd like to do. You, you want to say more securely. You may never be secure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. You know, it gives us uh, more work, work we can do later down the line. But you want to just work towards more security uh, and recognize the ambiguity as you do with the camels. I mean, the camels have thrown the ambiguity uh, factor right into it. That's right. Um, That's a very good point. Yeah, so I mean like, yeah, so I think uh, we have a lot to consider about all of that. And um, there's, I think, a whole paper on the camel stuff um, that is not written, as you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good points, I agree. Yeah, hey Jordan. Correct. Um, is there something in like the sediment type that's affecting that? Well, yeah. So I think one place to start is just like in terms of the, the setting in the first place. So a lot of the stainless work has been done in, um, in lakes and sediments where there's relatively not much movement um, of material. So, you know, there is, of course, some bioturbation with snails and things like that. But compared to a terrestrial kind of sense, where you've got all sorts of stuff, gerboa, all sorts of stuff digging around, mixing things up. And just the fact that there's gravity in pore spaces and water constantly flushing stuff down. 
makes me think that maybe in general, archaeological sites writ large are not the best place to directly try this method, which is kind of another thing that we might try to say, that you know, so far it had been mostly in, 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 at the bottom of lakes. Maybe there's something you said for kind of sticking to that. Um, so does that kind of answer that question, though? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, in terms of like, you know, they're charged. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of it too is that like there hasn't been a lot of testing of this method in general. So um, yeah, looking at different sediments would be really rewarding. Hey, Kevin. Sure. Yeah, so so people have So people have addressed this question of like, okay, can we we know that there's this confusion just to fecal sounds alone. Are there other things we can do to help answer that question? Um, some things that people have done is basically just looking at um, testing as many of these gut molecules as you can and looking at different ratios between them. And the idea that camels will have a little bit of this, but they'll have a lot of something else, right? Now Another problem there is that might be for herbivores. And then you have to say, OK, well, how do we tell the difference between a cow and a camel? At that point, it starts to get a little more complicated. So there are, has been work to try to say like human versus other work, um, looking at um, uh, uh, bile acids um, as well, just trying to get as many uh, um, sort of molecules in a line, and then trying to see if there's characteristic ratios between them. That's kind of where we're at. But there isn't been something where we can say almost like DNA to say, oh, this is indeed this one species. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, however, you know, genetic stuff is going crazy. I know nothing about it, but I mean, that might be the best answer to all of this. Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, what's up? Is there any, uh, uh, in terms of diet, uh, human and animal diets, like, is mm -hmm. there any? Yeah, so another big like, question that could totally be tested, to my knowledge, hasn't. Um, I think the way you do this is by tes testing yourself. Um, and so again, like, it, it may, maybe you know, we, I go like, totally just Atkins diet <laughs> and just eat a bunch of meat and then test my own feces and see, does, like, does that actually change the amount of molecules that are provided? Because it all, cholesterol is the, the parent ma material. So the amount of cholesterol should have some sort of uh, reflection on the amount that's coming out. However, we make cholesterol anyway, right? So you can be totally vegetarian and you're still going to be making some. So I think you're right that there could be something with diet as to whether or not that would be throwing off those numbers so much that it would look like you know a person who was vegan was looked like an animal <laughs> or something. I don't know if that would be that dramatic, but it's testable. Uh, so, I don't know what you're doing after class. We could, <laughs> could bring a sample vial. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's possible. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Okay.